Hi everybody, Ryan Jackson here and I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to be talking about fault currents, interrupting ratings, and short circuit current ratings. This is going to be based on the 2020 version of the National Electrical Code, although there weren't too many changes in the 2020 edition. Uh, most of these concepts are not new at all and actually have been in the code since the 1940s, but a lot of them are still very misunderstood. So let's go ahead and get into it. So the overview, why do we need to talk about this? What are the code rules pertaining to these issues? Well, multiple sections require the available fault current to be marked on the equipment or at least be calculated and made available to those that need it. 110.24, 408.6, and others. 110.9 is where we really get into the safety requirements, and that requires that overcurrent protection devices be used within their ratings, and we're going to call those interrupting ratings. And 110.10 requires that pretty much everything else, so the overall installation and all other equipment, must also be used within their ratings as well. So, a couple of definitions that we have to talk about. If we're going to be talking about fault current and interrupting ratings and short circuit current ratings and available fault current, we need to make sure that we're speaking the same language. So let's quickly get into Article 100. You can see by the underlined yellow text, this was a code change. So this is a new definition in the 2020 version of the NEC. And that is fault current. Certainly not a new concept, just something that hadn't been defined until the 2020 NEC. So the definition is the current that's delivered during a short circuit. So looking at the photograph here, we've got a couple of wires that are nearly touching each other. Uh, they're of different phase or different polarity, line and neutral, you know, two different hots. And you can tell that they're in the middle of an arcing fault. So however much current is flowing right now is the fault current. Now, if I were to take those wires and actually touch them together, and turn it on, then a lot more current would be flowing under that type of a fault. And we call that a bolted fault, where the conductors are actually touching each other, or they're in a lug together, or they're on a twist-on wire connector. That would be a bolted fault. And usually a bolted fault only happens from an installation error. You know, when we when we misphase something, we, we tape one wire black, and on the other end we tape it red, and we mix it, you know, somewhere. That would be a bolted fault, a, a gross misapplication, or a wiring error. In the real world, once we know that the installation is going to function correctly, if we have a fault after that, usually it would be an arcing fault, something like we have here in the picture, where we have some sort of an air gap between the conductors that are arcing together. Again, that's usually. So, how much current is flowing? That's the fault current. What is the available fault current? This is something that's been in the code for a very long time, but again, did not have a definition. So in the 2020, they added a definition, which I think was fantastic. And it's the largest amount of current that can be delivered at a given point on the system during a short circuit. All right, so one of the things you'll notice is that the available fault current is different throughout the system. Uh, this is something that when people first learn about interrupting ratings and about available fault current, they say, well, why doesn't the manufacturer mark the fault current? Well, because they can't, <laughs> because that's, that's installation specific. How much current would flow at a given location is going to be a function of that location. So there's different factors that need to be addressed, and we'll talk about those and, and how we got these numbers here. But suffice it to say, in this conduit here, if I were to take like a, a saw and cut through that conduit, how much current would flow during that fault? Well, at that point on the wiring system, we're going to say 11,800 amps. As I go a little farther away from the source, if I had a similar issue where we have a fault inside of this conduit, maybe it's 9,450 amps of current that's going to be flowing. And then as I get even farther still from the source, that number goes down to maybe 7,800 amps. So the available fault current is different at all points of the wiring system. And it's absolutely imperative that I know what the available fault current is. And we're gonna talk about why here in just a minute. But for right now, let's just come to the agreement that there is such a thing as available fault current, and we need to know what it is 
because at a minimum, we know that we have to mark it on some equipment. Now, generally speaking, it's a safe statement to say that the available fault current is highest nearest the supply source and lowest at the load. You'll remember in the previous picture where we showed kind of a little one line diagram and we showed that the fault current was getting lower the farther you got away from the source. And that's for good reason. If you were to go outside to a transformer and obviously I'm not telling you to do this, <laughs> but if you were to go outside to a transformer, open up the transformer and take like a little piece of conduit and just throw it into the transformer, how much current would flow as a result of that fault? That is the available fault current, how much would flow at that location. Now, as I get farther away from the source, if I do the math and it's 18,382 amps at the transformer, well, I add resistance in the form of conductors. Now, the voltage stays the same. I mean, granted, there's voltage drop, but, you know, it, it's still 480, you know, it's, it's still 208. So we're just talking nominal voltage. Uh, the farther I get from the source, the more resistance I add into the circuit. And, of course, Ohm's law is ultimately going to tell us that if the voltage stays the same and I add resistance, then the current is going to go down. So the farther I get from the source, the more resistance I have in the circuit, and the lower that fault current is going to get. So I know that if I'm doing this installation, 16,000 amps is a number that I need to know about. But how did I get this 18,000 amps over here at the transformer? How did I find that value? Well, they added a note in the 2020 NEC, an informational note. This is in 110.24a. Informational note number two says the available fault current can be obtained from the utility. Okay, well, that sounds easy enough. Call the utility and let them know. Say, hey, look, I'm, I'm wiring this building here in, uh, I don't know, Omaha, Nebraska, and I need to know the available fault current at this building at your transformer. And the utility might actually give you an answer. They might say, oh, yeah, we, we know what it is. It, it's 28,362 amps. Or they might just tell you, look, we don't know, so assume the worst. Go off the transformer nameplate. And usually, in my experience anyway, usually that's what the utility will do. They'll tell you just to assume the worst and use the transformer nameplate. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is we have our transformer outside by our building, and we don't really know how much resistance is upstream of the transformer. We, we don't know that. So we're going to just pretend that there is none. So we're going to just say there's no resistance upstream of the transformer because we don't know what it is anyway. So we're just going to pretend that the transformer is the, is the beginning of everything as far as your calculations. And that indeed would be the worst case scenario. So go off the nameplate. And what they often call that is using the infinite bus primary method. And it doesn't matter to me if you remember the phrase infinite bus primary, but I do think it's worth remembering the calculation because it's actually easier than a lot of people think. So how do I figure out the available fault current using this transformer? What is the absolute worst case, most amount of current that can come flowing out of this transformer under fault conditions? If I take that piece of conduit and toss it in the transformer, you're going to take the KVA, divide it by the secondary voltage, the output voltage, divided by the percentage of impedance. That's it. It's just a division problem. It's really not that bad. So you're going to take your KVA, which would be 75,000, 75,000 volt amps, divided by 240 volts. And then you're going to divide it by the percentage of impedance. Now, something that is easy to screw up on, and I've done this myself several times, Remember to move that decimal spot over two spots to the left because we're going from a decimal to a percentage or pardon me from a percentage to a decimal and I'm just going to give you a little piece of advice if you do the math and your answer is in the hundreds of amps instead of the thousands or even tens of thousands of amps if your number is in the hundreds of amps you did it wrong. You need to move that decimal spot two places to the left. A uh, very easy mistake to make. So you're going to take your output current, KVA divided by voltage, and then divide that by your impedance. So doing the math, 
18,382 amps at the transformer. So that gives me my starting point. I know that the available fault current there is 18,000 amps and change. And then I know if I add resistance from the transformer to my service disconnect, that number is going to be lower. Now, how much lower and how do I figure out the fault current decrease from point A to point B? Well, you can definitely get out a pen and paper and, and do the math. It, it's not terribly bad. But let's be honest here, it, it's, it's 2020. You have a calculator in your pocket and you have access to online apps. So do yourself a favor. I'm not in bed with Eaton. I don't, they don't pay me to, you know, to pump their product or anything. But I'm here to tell you this is an absolutely amazing application. It's free. So get on your phone, search for Eaton Busman FC2. Uh, I, I think you can just search Eaton FC2 now, but it used to be Busman FC2. So Busman, B-U-S-S-M-A-N-N. -N. And you can do all of it right on your calculator on your phone. It's a remarkable application. And again, it's free. So do yourself a favor, download this play with it. You can print from it. You can show the mathematics and you can put that on your panel schedule to show the AHJ how you got the uh, the available fault current that you're posting. So very useful application. Or if you're on a tablet, if you're online, or if you're in your office, you can also do their online version as well. And we'll go ahead and do one together. So taking a look at this transformer, 300 kVA, Three phase, 480 volt secondary, 4.2% impedance. So we know that we would just take 300,000 divided by what? Well, this is three phase. So divided by 480 times the square root of three. So 831, it's a number worth memorizing. 300,000 divided by 831 divided by 0.042 for my impedance percentage. Let's go ahead and do this example here on, uh, on Busman's online application. I'm gonna switch the camera view so you can see it a little bit easier. Uh, all I did is I searched for Busman FC2, use the online version, and it's going to bring up the online application, and it's going to give me some options right off the bat. So, three phase or single phase, this was three phase, we're going to add to my system because we're starting a new system. Let's go ahead and add a transformer. Yes, I have a known primary fault current. I could use that option if I called the utility and they gave me a number. But when I called the utility, they said, hey, we don't know, just assume the worst case. So no, assume infinite current on primary. We're gonna be doing that one. Transformer KVA is 300. Line to line voltage is 480 and the per, uh, the percent of impedance was 4.2 now down at the bottom you can see this percentage z tolerance minus 10 percent no change minimum fault and what that is saying is when they test transformers and and they write 4.2 percent impedance does that mean every single transformer that they make that's that's identical to that one? Or are they all going to be precisely 4.2%? No, no, that, that's not, there's going to be tiny little variations. So you're allowed to go plus or minus 10% of your marked impedance on your transformer. So now I'm not saying, you know, 4.2 up to 14.2. <laughs> I mean, 10% of 4.2. So let's make sure we're speaking the same language here. So when I'm doing this uh, design, I am going to go ahead and assume a 10% maximum fault because that really will give me the worst case scenario. And I'm gonna add it to my system. Next, it gives me a question and says, would you like to add motor contribution to this voltage? Now, this is an interesting concept. I can add motor contribution. Now, we know that the available fault current is how much current is going to flow if I take two wires and, and jam them together, right? How much current would flow? But one thing that we need to consider is if we have motors in our distribution system, those can actually act as current generators during a fault. And let me explain what I mean by that. The, the most fundamental, easiest concept for a, for a generator or a motor for me 
just something I can I can always wrap my head around is the in sync waste disposal that you have in your kitchen, right? Your garbage disposal. When I plug it in and I turn it on, so I'm providing it a source of electricity, the blades spin. Perfect. That's a motor, right? We all know this. But interestingly, if I were to unplug that motor and put my voltage leads, my test leads on the, the attachment plug, if I were to be measuring it for voltage and then reach my hand inside the sink and spin the blades as fast as I could, I would actually be creating voltage because a motor and a generator are, are pretty much the same thing. It's just a matter of if you're applying voltage to it, then you're making it spin and that's a motor. But if you're making it spin, then you would be creating voltage. And the reason that I'm saying all of this is, let's say I've got a big industrial facility. I've got all of these big, you know, 50 horsepower motors and they're all working, they're all turning. And then all of a sudden I have a fault that knocks out the service disconnect. So we've got a big fault somewhere and the thousand amp main stops, the, the thousand amp main opens. All of those motors that were turning are still going to be turning, right? They're, they're not just going to immediately freeze up and not be spinning anymore. So for a short amount of time, those motors are still turning, but if they're not using voltage, they're making voltage. So in that little brief duration, those motors are actually contributing current into the fault. So if we have a lot of motors, then we need to consider what we call motor contribution. So going back to it, yes, I want to add motor contribution to this voltage. Well, how much? You could do it as a percentage of the transformer. I always like to do it just in the total motor full load amps. So let's say I've got 100 amps worth of motor on my system. I need to add that in. Now I can take a look at my design. 300 kVA, 480 volt secondary, 4.2% impedance plus or minus 10% that gives me an available fault current of 9,548 amps, plus with the motor, it is 9,948 amps. So the motor contribution added about 9,900, or pardon me, it added about 400 amps of motor contribution. So doing this math, we are just about at 10,000 amps of available fault current. Now, if I wanted to delete the motor contribution, I could delete that, and then we would have just 9,500 amps. So maybe we're doing this calculation for a house and we've got just a very small amount of motors uh, and it's negligible. We don't really need to include it because it's not gonna add very much current. So 9,500 amps. So that's just kind of a, a quick example of how we can use different resources and determine the available fault current. All right, going back to the code requirements, we know how to calculate the available fault current. And of course, if you want to get deeper into that calculation, uh, you certainly can. As a matter of fact, if you're a power systems engineer, I'm going to recommend that you head over to my friend Thomas Dimitrovich's YouTube channel. Uh, he will show you how to do it using software and and do the uh, not just the uh, the point to point uh, basis that we're doing, but also the unit method, and uh, you know get into all of the equations and everything else. I'm more of just a code guy than a design guy, so I'm going to limit the calculations to something that we can all do relatively easy with a uh, with an online app. So getting back to the code requirements. Is this something that I really need to be concerned about if all I do is residential? Well, the answer is maybe. If all you're doing is one and two family dwellings, usually this isn't an issue because the utilities are not going to put such a huge transformer in front of your house that you could that it could deliver 50,000 amps of available fault current. There's just there's no reason for the utility to do that. They're going to put a 50 kVA transformer in front of your house and feed six or seven houses of it. There's no reason to park a 100 kVA or a 300 kVA transformer in a residential area. But I will tell you that that's not the case everywhere. Sometimes it can be an issue and it can definitely be an issue if you're doing multifamily. So if you're doing apartments or if you're doing townhouses, 
you know, it's easy enough for the utility to put a 50 kVA transformer in a neighborhood and supply six houses with it. But you really can't supply a, a, a 100 unit apartment building or four sixplex townhouses with a little 50 kVA transformer. You just can't do it. So once you start getting into bigger and bigger projects, usually the available fault current is going to increase and it becomes something that we need to be much more concerned about. So the utilities will often, but not always, add impedance to the system to limit the available fault current in residential areas. They don't want to provide you more than 10,000 amps. Number one, they don't need to, and number two, they don't want to. Because if you're just buying regular residential equipment, it's all going to be rated 10,000 amps. And they don't want to be in, in any sort of a conversation where they have to be asked, hey, why did you deliver 20,000 amps to this house? It's just a conversation that we don't need to be into. Now, getting back to the code, 110.24a was added back in the 2011 edition, and it says service, equipments at, <laughs> service equipment at other than dwellings must be marked with the available fault current, and the markings must include the date and withstand the environment. All right, so at the service equipment, the service disconnect, the first place you can shut off the utility, you need to mark the available fault current. So it's a little bit blurry, but on this label, it says the available fault current was calculated at 7,000 amps on uh, 1223 of 2013. Perfect, that would satisfy the requirement. There's also another requirement, if you keep reading, that says the calculation has to be documented and it has to be made available to those that are authorized to design, install, inspect, maintain, or operate the system. So how did you come up with that number? We need to know that. So one of the things that I like about that Eaton app, app is that you can print from it. Print from that, put it in the panel schedule, and you've satisfied the requirement. Otherwise, you might have to kind of type something out like I did here. The available fault current was calculated in 2019 using the infinite bus primary. We had a 750 kVA transformer, three phase, 480 volt secondary, 3.4% impedance, which means the available fault current was 29,500 amps at the transformer. Uh, motor ne uh, contribution was negligible. We don't really have much motors in this facility. We had 100 feet of three 500 kc mil copper in a PVC conduit to the service disconnect, which means the available fault current at the service disconnect was 26,000 amps in change. All right, let's go ahead and add some conductors to that system that we figured out. So we know the available fault current on our 300 kVA 480 volt 4.2% impedance transformer, 9,548 amps right at the transformer. But let's go ahead and add some conductor length. So we're going to add 150 feet, one conductor per phase because it's not in parallel. We're gonna run some four gauge conductors. They will be copper, three single conductors in a steel conduit. And let's see what that does to the available fault current. We know it's going to decrease it. So at the end of that 150 foot run, I have gone from about 9,600 amps down to just over 4,000 amps. So once again, the farther you get from the source, the lower that number is going to get. So I am going to figure out what that number is and I'm going to mark it on my equipment. Something that was added in the 2020 code is 408.6, which of course is in the panel board, switchboard, switchgear article. It says switchboard, switchgear, and panel boards must have a short circuit current rating that is not less than the available fault current. Okay, well, we haven't talked about what this means yet. So this panel has a short circuit current rating of 10,000 amps. Perfect. So I know that I could put this panel board anywhere where the available fault current is not greater than 10,000 amps. And to be honest, this language is new in Article 408, but it's not new to the code. This has been in 110.10 for a very long time. What's really new is this part of 408.6. <clears throat> in other than one and two family dwellings, the available fault current and the date the calculation was performed must be marked on the enclosure. That's every panel board, switchboard, or switch gear in the building. 
for other than one and two family dwellings. This is a pretty significant change. So any panel, any switchboard or any switch gear in the building has to be marked with the available fault current. Now, personally, I think this is a great rule. I have to know the available fault current at every panel because I need to know what the short circuit current rating of the panel needs to be. If I didn't know that the available fault current was 16,450 amps, I might have mistakenly installed this panel that's only rated for 10,000 amps. So I have to know this number. And now I have to mark it on all of my switchboards, switch gear, or panel boards. Something that's kind of interesting about this, and you'll find out uh, the more you do these calculations, you'll, you'll start to really understand this, but a lot of times when we look at a panel like this, we automatically assume that the fault current is going to be something that's rather low. And when we look at a piece of equipment like this, we oftentimes immediately think that the fault current is going to be high. And that's really not the case. It, it, it depends on a lot of different variables. At this application, we marked it saying that the available fault current is 21,000 amps. It could just as easily have been 65,000 amps or 6,000 amps. It all depends on how far from the source, what the voltage is, how big the transformer is. So don't look at a piece of equipment and assume that you know anything about the available fault current because you, you can't until you do the calculation. So we need to mark our equipment with the available fault current. Now, I'm going to go back to 110.24 for a moment. That's the rule that said you had to mark the service disconnect. And that's where the marking requirements first started in the NEC. And when they added this, they also gave us this clarification saying, listen, these markings are to ensure compliance with 110.9 and 110.10 for equipment ratings. For information on arc flash hazard analysis, you need to go to NFPA 70E. So we are marking the available fault current so that we can properly rate and properly install our equipment. That's why we're marking it with the available fault current to ensure compliance with 110.9 and 110.10. So what do those two sections say? Well, 110.9 is the interrupting rating. It says overcurrent devices must have an interrupting rating that's at least equal to the available fault current at the line terminals of the equipment. Okay, so we need an interrupting rating. Now, by the way, what is the interrupting rating on this circuit breaker? 10,000 amps. That is what our 10KA is. So that has an interrupting rating of 10,000 amps. But what does that mean? What, what's an interrupting rating? Well, it's defined in Article 100. It's the highest current at its rated voltage that a device is rated to interrupt under test conditions. All right, so what does a circuit breaker or fuse do? It interrupts current. That's the whole purpose of its being, right? Is to interrupt current, including fault currents. So how much current can this thing interrupt at its rated voltage under test conditions? And by the way, those test conditions are pretty nasty. If your breaker still functions after a fault, for the most part, you pass the test. And I'm, I'm just kind of paraphrasing the standard, but it's almost a destructive test. If you install circuit breakers outside of their limitations, circuit breakers or fuses, outside of their interrupting ratings, the results are catastrophic fails. This is from our friends at Eaton once again. This is a circuit breaker rated 14,000 amps, and it's being subjected to 50,000 amps. And if you look closely, you can see that they've just jumpered the load side of the breaker line to line. So we're just gonna have a direct 480 volt short circuit. And again, that's rated 14,000 amps and we're putting 50,000 amps across it. Now that's a gross misapplication and we've got fire and everything else shooting out of the circuit breaker. But if you really think about it, do you check the interrupting ratings when you're replacing circuit breakers? You know, I, I, I wish that I was lying and, and, and I could tell you that I always did. But, you know, for a, a good part of my career, I didn't know anything about interrupting ratings, short circuit current ratings, or available fault currents. And I think a lot of electricians are that way. So, if you're being honest with yourself, could you say that you never replaced a 22,000 amp rated breaker with a 10,000 amp rate, rated breaker? Because, you know, if you go to the supply house 
and you just say, hey, get me a, a, a Cutler Hammer single pull 20 amp BR series breaker. If you don't tell them a specific interrupting rating, they're going to give you a 10,000 amp rated breaker. So are you checking that before you install it into your equipment? Is there a chance that you have installed a 14,000 amp rated breaker at a location that could deliver 50,000 amps? The answer is probably yes, you know, if we're all being honest with each other. Because at some point in our careers, we probably didn't know that this was an issue. And that's where we can really get into some dangerous situations like arc flash and arc blast, things of that nature. So interrupting rating is the amount of current that it can withstand pretty much without blowing up, if we're being perfectly honest. Okay, let's read that code rule one more time. 110.9 interrupting rating. Overcurrent devices must have an interrupting rating that's at least equal to the available fault current at the line terminals of the equipment. So looking at this fuse, this has two interrupting ratings because it has two voltage ratings. On the top, 250 volts AC, it's rated for 200,000 amps of current. If I'm installing it in a DC system, it's rated for 100,000 amps. So my interrupting rating depends on the voltage that it's being applied to. So either 200,000 amps or 100,000 amps in that application. If I look at the picture here, we're going to figure out what rating of circuit breakers or fuses we would need in this application. Because again, it's rated, it's based on the interrupt, the available fault current on the line side of the equipment. So here we've got 11,800 amps available. Now, if I were to move this arrow down right to where the conduit enters the panel, that number is going to be lower, right? But honestly, maybe it's what, 11,700 amps? So here's the question. Which breakers need to be rated to handle that 11,700 amps? Is it the breakers up here? Well, certainly they do but also the breakers down here because we're going to rate the downstream breaker based on the available fault current on the line side of its terminations. And that seems a little bit weird. Normally we rate breakers and fuses based on what happens downstream of them. We're actually doing this based on what happens upstream. And the reason for that, let's just say that at this panel board, the available fault current right where the wires enter the panel is I don't know, let's say it's 25,000 amps. And this run here is extremely long with some small wires. And halfway through, the available fault current is 11,800 amps. Well, does that mean the breakers only have to be rated to handle the 11,800 amps? Well, no, because who knows where that fault's going to happen? It could happen in the middle of the raceway. It could happen right at the terminations inside the panel where the available fault current was like 25,499 amps. So we're going to rate the overcurrent device based on the available fault current on the line side terminals. On this panel board here, as soon as I leave the panel, it's down to like 9,450 amps. But on the line side, it was more than 10,000 which means I could not use 10,000 amp rated breakers in this panel. I would have to rate these for whatever the available fault current is on the line side terminals. These fuses here, at the line side of the fuse holders, the available fault current is gonna be less than 10,000 amps. So I could, I could size these fuses at 10,000 amps I might have to have 22,000 amp rated circuit breakers in this panel board, and I might have to have 42,000 amp rated breakers up here in this panel board. Those are just kind of the standard ratings, 10,000, 22, 42,000 amp rated devices. So we need to make sure that we're sizing our circuit breakers based on the available fault current. So that's what 110.9 tells us. If I keep reading in the codebook, 110.10, the very next section, says that all equipment, devices, circuit impedance, equipment ratings, and everything else must be designed and installed to allow overcurrent devices to open without damage. So here's where we're starting to talk about short circuit current ratings. This panel board 
is rated 10,000 amps. It doesn't make any sense to do the math and figure out that you need 22,000 amp rated breakers. So you go to the store and buy all these 22K rated breakers and then install them in a panel that's only rated 10,000 amps. So it's not just the overcurrent devices, it's the equipment as well. Now, how do we know how to satisfy this requirement? Well, it goes on to say, look, listed equipment installed in compliance with its instructions and ratings is considered compliant. So the instructions on this piece of equipment, it says that the short circuit rating of this panel board is 200,000 amps RMS symmetrical at 240 volts. So that's got a huge short circuit current rating. I can put this pretty much anywhere, right? Well, I need to keep reading. Or 22,000 amps symmetrical if it's equipped with main lugs or feed through lugs with no overcurrent protection device installed upstream. So in other words, if I'm using this as the service disconnect and there is no breaker protecting this panel, no breaker or fuse, then it's not rated 200,000 amps anymore. It's only rated 22,000 amps. Or the lowest rated device that's installed. So if I've got some 10K rated breakers inside of this enclosure, that means my panel is only rated 10K. So we need to make sure we're following the instructions and that we're rating our equipment appropriately. Now, sometimes we might find instructions that seem rather unusual. This is kind of a, a strange looking application if you've never seen it before. And you're, maybe you're looking at this and saying, okay, why do I have a bunch of ropes wrapped around my wires? Well, that's actually required in the instructions for this piece of equipment. This equipment has a short circuit current rating of 50,000 amps RMS. And it says, wrap all line cables together and all load cables together with nylon rope, nominally 3 8 of an inch in diameter or with a certain tensile strength. Minimum wrapping is six inches and then 12 inches from the terminals with five wraps and an additional six inches with five more wraps or one inch every one wrap. So you get the idea. This uh, bracing or lashing, as we call it, is actually sometimes required by the manufacturer of the equipment. And that's usually based on the short circuit current rating and equipment that has a high short circuit current rating. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard a fault occur, a short circuit or a ground fault? I, I remember the first time I heard it and, and it was explained to me what I just heard. I was an apprentice and it was the first day that we energized equipment, which of course is, is probably the most dangerous day on the job for an electrician is the day you turn on the power. You know, if something's wrong, that's when you're going to find out. And, you know, we, we tested out all the mains and everything and, and energized it. And then when we were trip opening the individual 20 amp circuit breakers, one of them tripped immediately. And you could actually hear the wires inside the conduit smack up against the conduit. So it was like a couple of pieces of 12 gauge wire and the, the magnetic effects of all of that current actually shake those conductors inside the conduit. And it was pretty amazing when my foreman explained to me that that was the magnetic effects of thousands of amps flowing across those conductors for a, for a very short duration of time. So looking at this picture, if the available fault current here is 50,000 amps, and we've got like, I don't know, 20, 500 KC mills all in there. Imagine what that would look like when I have, you know, 50,000 amps flowing through those conductors. I've actually got a short little video that we're going to watch here. And this is a test again from our friends at Eaton showing what it looks like when I take 90 feet of 2 watt conductor and subject it to 16,000 amps. Take a look at the video, I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, kind of an interesting video, isn't it? So the effects of 16,000 amps on a 480 volt wire, uh, 90 feet long, two watt conductor, uh, the effects of it are absolutely amazing. So you can see why some manufacturers might require you to actually brace those conductors together. Uh, it might be rope. 
Sometimes it might be plastic. Sometimes it might depend on whether the lugs are set screw like this or if they're actual crimped lugs that are bolted to the enclosure. Um, but again, follow the instructions and take a peek at what they have you do because it might surprise you. All right. So we made it through 110.9 and 110.10, as well as some of the marking requirements. Uh, a bit later, I'm going to do another video to talk about how we can comply with some more uh, difficult installations, things like series rated systems and selective coordination. So I just wanted to kind of create a baseline understanding of interrupting ratings and short circuit current ratings and available fault current. So I hope you got something out of this video and we'll see you next time. Be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and ring the bell.